Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a muggy, miserable, crappy Florida Tuesday. Uh, I really do have to say, it is, I mean, I can't even look at the viewfinder on the camera because my glasses have fogged up. Uh, the humidity is thick in the air. We've had some rain, which has added to it. Uh, the ground is wet, and now it's going to start evaporating up from there. And we're just living in a misty fog, which is... You know, it's not even May yet, and uh, here we are in this condition. So I can only imagine what uh, July and August are going to be like. Uh, bird activity, I heard a woodpecker earlier. I haven't seen him or heard him since, so uh, hopefully he's gone away. Uh, also, the goats. Uh, you know, after that debacle with the uh, Porsche Boxster, they have not been seen or heard from in a few days. Uh, what became of them, if they're still back there, I don't know. Uh, I'm tempted to take a walk back and see what uh, what we find, but frankly, I'm a little bit afraid to. Uh, I don't think Peter took kindly to the goats walking <coughs> on a car in his front yard, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, and uh, otherwise, we're going to hop right into this car. Uh, and frankly, to me, this is a little bit of a treat. I'm having fun with this one. I really, really am. Uh, this is a 1993 Pontiac Grand Prix. Uh, this is an SE Coupe, actually with a ton of options. So it uh, makes it kind of more interesting. Uh, you know, the good news is for me that the pressure is off. And all fronts, the pressure is off. Uh, I've recently done uh, a Grand Prix. I did that, uh, what, we did that 77 uh, SJ Grand Prix. So we got into the history of the things. And uh, I also did a, a big video on the GM10 body and all the plant, the uh, Buick Regal, the Olds Cutlass uh, Supreme, and, uh, of course, the Grand Prix that came out in 88, these front drivers. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to link to both those videos in the description because they cover all this stuff in depth. Uh, additionally, I don't even have to get into what happened in 93 because I did that uh, in that Lexus video, the SC400, a uh, 93 model, uh, you know, maybe a week ago or so. And uh, thank God for that because 93 was an intensely boring year. So all the pressure is off and I can just have a little bit of fun going through this particular car, uh, getting into it and not delving into all the other crap around it. If you want to get into the history of the GM10 or the Grand Prix, uh, go ahead and click those videos beneath. They're uh, pretty in-depth and they'll give you what you need to know. So this one's just going to be about this particular car. Uh, it came out of the south. I think it came from Tennessee. Uh, came through a connection of mine, which I'm very happy to have because he gets some pretty neat stuff. And uh, this was one of them. Uh, this is an 11,000 mile uh, 1993 Grand Prix SE with a pretty good option package and a loving history. And uh, man, am I having fun driving it, even if I'm not particularly in love with the GM10 platform. But anyway, we'll get into all that as we start going. I love the lights up front. Uh, you know, the quads with the uh, parking or uh, marker light in the center. It looks like it's got six headlights of sorts. Uh, and of course, the two big fogs beneath. The classic Pontiac split grille. Uh, it does have some uh, historical styling features. Uh, there were seven generations of Grand Prix from 1962 through 2008. Uh, this was the fifth generation. Uh, it replaced the G-Body Grand Prix, which was a rear-wheel drive coupe, uh, you know, this being a front-wheel drive coupe. And it was not, it gets very complicated because initially it was beloved. People bought them like crazy. In fact, dealers were able to charge over sticker for them in the beginning because there was a, a throng of people lining up to buy them. And they never really fell off. I mean, they weren't a great sales success. They certainly weren't worth the billions of dollars that GM spent developing the GM10 platform. Uh, but they didn't do bad. I don't think in their uh, years of production, I think I want to say through 96, this body reigned. Uh, I don't think they ever went beneath 100,000 units. So, uh, so so they did sell pretty well, but of course a big portion of that uh, was uh, Pontiac's racing prowess in the early 90s, which uh, also, as we get into this car, uh, we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, the styling of the car. <laughs> 
you know, I'm torn on this one. I really am. I mean, I don't like the base Grand Prix without the aero package. Uh, the aero package, you see those lines down the body cladding, all that 80s uh, over cladding stuff with the big wheel arches and fender flares and the alloy wheels and stuff. Uh, it's not really gorgeous to look at or anything, but I also kind of dig it, and I think it looks pretty cool on this. And I love this car from a retro viewpoint. I do like driving it around. You know, they were once all over the roads, but they all got used up. I mean, they became uh, a very reliable go-to used car for kids or college students or people who needed a cheap ride or whatnot. So they all got shredded, and there just aren't that many left, and certainly not many left in this condition, which, uh, uh, you know, it turns heads. It really does. Driving this thing around has been kind of fun. I don't think these uh, Goodyear Eagle number one NASCAR tires hurt either. They really do set the car apart. Uh, they're phenomenally expensive, and uh, they do look pretty cool on this. And of course, whoever owned this particular car uh, was uh, obviously a huge NASCAR fan, which uh, again, we'll get into as we go. And I do have to say, I feel weird walking around it, not having to get into the history and all this stuff. It's just nice to have all the pressure off. I'm even going to link that Lexus. At no, you know what? I, I hated that Lexus SC video. I just... I don't know if it was a mixture of all the drugs and the whiskey or whatnot, but I just rambled and rambled and rambled, and uh, it <laughs> really took some of the joy out of it for me, so uh, I'm going to pretend that video doesn't exist. Look at the big twice pipes at the bottom of those rectangular uh, tubes. That looks pretty cool. Uh, all right, well, let's just get into the back of this thing. I hear Peter firing up the Kubota over there, so uh, maybe he is uh, still going to feed the goats. Okay, the GM10 had a nice big trunk. Uh, part of that is because it had uh, uh, a pretty non-intrusive suspension in the back. It was independent, as you would expect from a front-wheel drive car. Uh, it used uh, um, a monoleaf spring. And, you know, I'm not sure if it still did in 93, but it sure looks like it, because I don't see big uh, pillars for coil springs or whatnot. So uh, maybe it does. I don't know. I don't really even care. Uh, anyway, you can see <laughs> this guy had the uh, 93. Uh, Rusty Wallace uh, Pontiac Miller Genuine draft car from Penske Racing, I believe he raced for in 93. Uh, Rusty was a guy who had tremendous success in NASCAR. Absolutely amazing success. His dad was a racer. His two brothers were racers. Uh, in fact, there was one race, uh, the Pyroyal, P-Royal, I don't even know how you say that, uh, 500, where all three brothers competed at the same time, and that was kind of a notable moment in NASCAR. Uh, this one still does does have its infant containment net, although it's a bit, I don't know, it's its a bit too loosey-goosey. I don't think it's going to really contain your infants very well. Uh, you can try. You could put a toddler and an infant back there. If you're lucky, his little, his little arm and fingers make it caught in the net and he can't move forward and get to the pass-through, uh, which this thing does have in case you have long uh, cargo. But uh, if you're unlucky, he will get through that, go up there and make his way into the cabin. So hopefully that doesn't happen. Anyway, there it is, back when you could actually have uh, beer or cigarette labels on your, you know, toy cars. I don't know, maybe you still can, I don't know, if you sign a release form or something. And, uh, and that thing's kind of cool, so that's going to go with the car. Uh, also, uh, you have a uh, budge car cover there, which this thing apparently sat indoors with a cover on it, and frankly, I believe it. Uh, it's all original paint and pretty miraculous to look at, but a nice big trunk in this car. Uh, the GM10s had these funky pillar-mounted door handles. I kind of like. Uh, they're pointless and still I kind of like them so give it a tug and up it comes. Also this weird hood release uh, which is down where you'd expect the trunk release to be. Have a look under the hood here. Oh boy there it is. Okay so this is a 3.4 liter uh, twin cam uh, multi-valve V6. It's the second gen of the 60 degree GM V6 engine and it's widely considered to be the uh, the best of the engines that was offered in this original Grand Prix series. I mean there was a 3.1 with a turbo uh, built by McLaren. It was called the ASC McLaren Turbo. It came out in 89. Very limited production and uh, it actually put out five more horsepower than this one but of course you get all the complexity of the turbo and whatnot so uh, 
who knows if it's better. I, I think I'd prefer to just have a, uh, if you can get the same horsepower out of a naturally aspirated V6, I think I'll take this, even if it is Canadian built. But um, but anyway, there it is. So this was the optional engine in this year. Uh, you could get the Quad 4 as a base engine, the 3 one as a no-cost option. Uh, they did have a 5-speed transmission you could get, uh, and of course uh, a 4-speed automatic. But, uh, you know, pretty venerable engine in this car. Runs pretty great. Uh, you can put a lot of miles on them. Uh, in later gens, I think 07 onward, you could get the 3800, which is probably even better. Uh, but of course that is a, a different body style from this one so uh, anyway didn't even clean this this is all original I wouldn't let Dalton touch it with the pressure washer. even has some kind of a little bird poop on it or something I don't know what the hell that was but it's stuck under my nail and it's disgusting um, <clears throat> but anyway this is the original engine bay no cleaning ever uh, on this 11,000 mile car uh, just an absolute time machine even the clarity of that bright uh, underhood light uh, which uh, I believe you can remove and move around if you need to do it there's that woodpecker and he's close Man, I tell you what, those things freak me right the hell out. I mean, they can swoop in, uh, they can attach to your neck and start pecking at your head. There he is, I see him. There he is, there's the little bastard. Yeah, I don't know what he thinks he's going to find on that river. He flew off, he knew I was looking at him. <sighs> anyway, hopefully he stays way over there and doesn't come near us. And uh, there it goes down. Uh, I'm going to be deadly honest here with something. Now, the front end of this unit, this car, uh, with the uh, recessed lights underneath those angular slits, which are quite narrow and actually kind of cool, I have to say, I have no idea what the story is with them. Because the in 88, the Grand Prix that came out, it was uh, Motor Trend's car of the year. Uh, they had incredible ads for it. Uh, guitars flying. Uh, weirdly, they had a guy with a mullet, but he's wearing a suit. And uh, his lady friend might have had a neck tattoo, but she was holding a tennis racket and coming out of a club. So uh, very confusing messages there. Uh, crazy guitar going, and they're telling you to get on your Pontiac and ride. Uh, if I find one, I'll also put a link to that ad in the description. That sounds more like an insult to me than a promotion. Get on your Pontiac and ride. You know, get on your on your pole and spin or I don't know it just seems a bit strange uh, but uh, that's what they had anyway and uh, you know it seemed to work again uh, but I blame a lot of this car's success on the uh, uh, on the NASCAR racing at the time it really was prolific a lot of good drivers uh, uh, did drive these things the least of which wasn't R uh, Richard Petty or Rusty Wallace so uh, that helped a lot to make these cars popular and I do like those wheels. There's the 24 valve V6 emblem, uh, all original paint, being an upmarket option. This thing has the uh, fog lights in the front. And uh, an ASC sunroof, which is not a factory sunroof. And in fact, in some ways, it's much more complicated and scarier than a factory sunroof. But, and we'll get into that as we go. All right, so inside is where Pontiac really went absolutely insane. Uh, and. This is all going to come together into one theme about how this happened and why it happened. But uh, the switch gear in this car is ludicrous. I mean, you've got these, uh, well, we'll do it when we get into the car. So I'll just, I'll get into it in a minute and we'll get through all that. But uh, okay, here you can see the door panels, uh, you know, nice mixture of cloth and plastic, uh, probably a little more upmarket than it was in 1988 when it was really cheap. Uh, that Buick Regal we did, the 88 release, God, was that car just cheap in terms of what they used. Uh, because it didn't have airbags, that was all starting to become a thing. Uh, it had seat belts built into the doors. I think the first year they did that, they had to stay connected. So when you would open the doors, the seat belts would come out. Uh, maybe through some, you know, lovely glitch of time, they were able to let you release them at this point, as long as they were just in the doors, which is nice. Uh, but anyway, that was part of that uh, U.S. safety standard stuff at the time. Uh, and because it didn't have airbags, you could get away with having that ridiculous steering wheel that looks like it's from the Millennium Falcon or something. Uh, here you see the ASC sticker uh, that was uh, put on when, uh, you know, they installed the sunroof. I don't know if that happened at the dealer or not. Uh, you could get a four-seat, uh, sorry, a two-seat back seat option, which a lot of these had. 
uh, this car being so well equipped and sporty, I was surprised to see the uh, uh, three seat option in the back. Makes me wonder if this wasn't uh, picked as a family truckster by some uh, NASCAR family. Although, you know, with 11,000 miles, I doubt it because they really didn't drive it too much. But uh, anyway, there it is. Nice uh, little clothy buckets back there. Pr pretty good footroom, you have to say. Uh, you know, the Canadians are going to be pretty chipper in the back, no issues. Got a weird little place to put stuff. I don't know, you could put a gun right in front of that center brake light and behind the seat where there's a dip, but I have a feeling if you hit the brakes too hard, it's going to come flying out and you don't want that. Uh, you do get this armrest. Oh, God, I'm leaning in here. Anyway, you get a little armrest here, a little place to put your uh, narcotics while you're, you know, rolling a J or whatever it is you do in the 80s. And uh, there's your uh, pass-through into the trunk if you have uh, longer cargo. So the little nets on the back of the seat. Doesn't look thick enough to get an infant in there unless it's really small. So anyway, let's just hop in and talk about the instrument cluster a little bit. I tell you what, actually, what I'm going to do is get all my crap in the trunk, get myself ready to go. Uh, I'll pull up to where those trees are in the shade, and uh, we'll take it from there. Hold on one moment. All right, so um, let's hop in and give it a spin. I have to say, I do quite even like these little gridded, checkerboard-looking taillights that came with the Aero package. I don't know, maybe I'm just a sucker for... Uh, uh, for bling, but uh, yeah, and the tires I really dig, I have to say, with the NASCAR logo, the lace, the ABS. What can I say? You know, maybe I'm just a product of my youth. I was kind of still like kind of that rabbit right there, the way he's staring at me, staring me down. Glad I'm getting in the car. I read a news story once where one of those things leapt up and killed a guy. And he's staring right at me. And when I'm driving down this road in the morning, getting here, they try to commit suicide in front of the car. I don't know what makes rabbits so depressed, but uh, they do seem to want to get crushed underneath tires. So anyway, let's fire this thing up. There's that big six firing to life. Sounds nice. The Canadians did a nice job on that one. And uh, we'll get our seatbelt on. Okay, so now here's here's where the theme of this video is going. First of all, you see the heads-up display. Uh, again, this is 1993, and there's something I love about these old low-mileage cars that still have all the tech functioning. Uh, let me get a little bit of AC going, because it is a bit... Uh is a bit tepid this morning, too, on the fan. Okay, Pony, I... All right, and my glasses, I can't see anything. They're fogged up. I mean, look at the switch gear in this car. You've got these crazy wing things on either side of the cluster. Uh, here's your headlights and dimmer over here. Uh, headlights, parking lights, fog lamps, uh, all very fascinating. Uh, over here you've got your wipers, mist, here's your heads up stuff, you can uh, dim it, uh, you can adjust the uh, height of it depending on how tall or short you are. Uh, you've got a tilt steering wheel little thing there. And uh, again, being pre-airbag, uh, companies were free to do whatever the hell they wanted with the steering wheel. Uh, got a horn. Look at the buttons on this steering wheel. I mean, I, I know they're all very simple. Balance fader, your preset, seek, volume, on and off, uh, stop and play, tune, AM, FM, mute, and volume, and of course your horns. Uh, but I mean, the way it looks is insane. Uh, over here you've got these weird little pull handles. Uh, and the way they are set up, I mean, they almost feel like it's missing a plastic cover or something, but it's not. That's just how they're supposed to be. Uh, your power mirrors, your Grand Prix thing. Uh, I presume on old beat-up cars, all this stuff exploded, but I mean, it is tight and nice and together on this one, uh, as it should be with the miles. There you see, uh, yeah, just 11,000 on the clock. Uh, you've got a full gauge package. That was part of the options in this car. So you've got your voltmeter, your oil pressure, uh, your fuel, your water temp. Uh, 7,000 RPM redline. I didn't really look into that, but my God, do I need to. I can't believe this thing has the same redline as my Miata. Uh, I see it's getting yellow at 6,500, but that's insane. I had no idea you could spin this thing up to seven grand. Uh, frankly, I bet it sucks when you do your <laughs> 
probably well out of the power curve. Uh, you've got this tiny, I mean, God help you if you're an old guy. Thank God they sold these to young people. Look at this tiny little climate control area. I mean, it's not even the size of a business card and it covers 20 different functions. You've got your, uh, you've got your slider for uh, temperature. Uh, you've got your fan speed, you've got your rear defrost, front defrost, I mean all of that in this tiny little area. Uh, a fairly standard uh, area for the uh, 90s Delco Bose, I don't think this is Bose, but anyway Delco, uh, with the graphic equalizer and the cassette. And uh, in my back pocket I do have a cassette adapter so I could get into my uh, country music again. Well, let's see what's on the radio. Yeah, of course, commercial. So uh, I don't know what option, if any, would have gone in there, but it's a nice place for a pack of cigarettes, as uh, a lot of the guys who owned these were NASCAR types would have had. Uh, this one also had the optional uh, trip computer, systems check, compass, what have you. And uh, man, I have to admit, I think it's really cool gadgetry. Uh, you've got this sort of, uh, you know, remember the 80s video game, uh, what the hell was it, Defender? Uh, it just reminds me of those graphics. And I had to calibrate this compass yesterday because nobody driven this car in a while. And to do that, I had to press calibrate, go into a parking lot, drive circles until it was happy, and uh, then point the car north and press north. And then it calibrated. So uh, I don't know. I think that's really cool. I hate to admit that I'm wowed by that, but I am. And uh, I do just love early tech in some of these cars. Uh, it gives you your range. It gives you your average speed. We're going pretty slow. Low. Average economy, 18. That's not too bad, really, considering this thing idles most of the time. Uh, we've got a systems check. <clears throat> Let me just service the car so everything's been reset. You go through your oil, oil filter. It just counts it down based on mileage. It doesn't sense anything. It's just a mileage-based reminder. Uh, here's your narrow middle center console. Leather wrap shifter. You could get a stick in these, but I think most of them had autos. Uh, but you see a nice little shifter and four-speed, uh, whatever. Uh, nobody apparently smoked in this car, which is sinful, considering it's a Grand Prix. And you have this tiny little ashtray. Uh, also a little nifty center console. Very nice place to put a compact 9, even maybe a full-size 9. And of course, a lot of your narcotics are going to go in that little uh, pouch right there. Uh, okay, over here you've got uh, one of the more bizarre features of the Grand Prix, and that was the combination lock glove box. Yeah, the combination <laughs> glove box. Why, nobody knows. You could just have a key. Uh, there's a little fuse panel in here, rear trunk release. Oh my god, let me grab all this crap out of here and we'll go through it. All right, that's, I'll put that back in, but that's the original wheel locks. Hopefully they're not installed because I hate wheel locks. Uh, this does have this uh, ASC sunroof, which is about as fancy a sunroof as you could get at the time. It was either dealer installed or you could uh, get it directly through ASC. And believe me, you need this owner's manual. I mean, this thing is not your average sunroof. It's actually kind of ridiculous. Uh, okay, so you've got all these switches and buttons here. I'm gonna open it up. Okay, I think I do it that way. You can see it slides back. It's a nice big sunroof. It's also got a, a shade vent. Now, when I shut the car off, it closes because that's what ASC wanted to do. And you know what? I actually do really like that feature uh, because you wouldn't believe over the years, you know, most of the dealerships I've been with have already... Uh, have been part of a service uh, setup. You know, we do repair work. Quite a few problems have come from people forgetting to close their sunroof, and uh, then it rains, and the next thing you know, whammo. Uh, their uh, electronics are all wet, and half of them are destroyed. So it's actually a pretty damn nice feature, uh, the way that closes itself and reminds you. I have to hand it to ASC on that one. But I mean, there's like six different switches and knobs for this thing that's oh god that's the vent uh, and that goes back again and then when i close it manual oh no it will close automatically no that's the vent again oh, see what i mean this is what uh, you know what the best way for me to shut this or close this is just to turn off the damn and now it doesn't do it because it just <sighs> i think you have to have this switch on see if that does it yeah, that was that. So apparently for it to self-close, you actually do have to have a switch on. 
All right, that's the last I'm ever going to use that sunroof, and we'll just get back into this crap. So uh, that's the ASC sunroof. Here's the window sticker, which is two pages. You can tell this guy put some, put some options on this thing. Uh, there we go. So a base price of fifteen three ninety, and uh, he ended up paying uh, over twenty two grand, and that's with an eleven hundred dollar discount for some kind of, uh, you know, package. Uh, you've got transmission oil cooling. You've got rally handling suspension. You've got uh, the power antenna, which by the way is black, and I want to show you that because it looks so cool. This car kind of locks you won't see out unless you hit a button. But yeah, look at that black power antenna. I do think that's kind of neat, and it still works. Back in. And, uh, well, anyway, there it is. It's just nice to see all that crap still with the car. Uh, and you could barely see it, but there's the Aero Performance Package, which ground effects and cladding, and the 225-6016 uh, dual exhaust, uh, the big engine, blah, blah, blah. Very, very nice equipment on this car. Uh, frankly, befitting of a higher trim package than this one had. So somebody really ordered a lot of crap for this. Uh, here is probably my favorite feature on this car. When I pull down the passenger sun visor, and let's see if we can, yeah, there it is. We've got two signatures. We've got Rusty Wallace, number two, and we've got his brother, uh, Kenny Wallace, not Mike Wallace and not the 60 Minutes guy, but he was the third brother. Uh, but anyway, there you go. So you had Rusty and Kenny sign this thing. Uh, Kenny, you know, he had a decent career, but he did much better in the Bush series. Uh, Rusty Wallace had an amazing career in the Winston Cup series, which of course now is Nextel or Comcast or whatever the hell it became when cigarettes became taboo. Uh, but uh, this one is signed by Rusty. Uh, 93 was probably his most interesting year, which of course is the year of this car and the year of that model in the back. Uh, it's when he drove a, uh, a chassis he named Midnight, which was his favorite chassis. He drove it for like six years and uh, won a ton of races. He won 10 races in 93. Uh, his buddy, Alan Kulwicki, who uh, he came up with through, you know, all the early your series ended up dying very sad flying into the Bristol it seems like all these NASCAR guys die in airplanes or helicopters I mean it's just you know just because you can turn left at high speeds doesn't necessarily mean you can fly a, a Hughes uh, helicopter but apparently they think it does and uh, as a result a lot of them end up ashes but uh, anyway so Rusty was pretty sad over the death of Alan and for every one of his wins he did a Polish victory lap which was Alan Kulwicki's uh, uh, trademark where he uh, after you know getting the checkered flag would drive the wrong way around the racetrack and uh, to the delight of fans everywhere and uh, in 93 Rusty kept that going as a tribute and that was all very nice stuff I remember all that that was kind of cool uh, but anyway so this car comes with uh, authentic uh, Wallace Brothers signatures on the uh, sun visor, which is pretty neat stuff, I think. I mean, if you're going to have a NASCAR driver sign any car, it might as well be a 93 Grand Prix. <clears throat> and so that gets to my point, and the final point as we go for our little drive here. Um, you know, Pontiac wowed you with gadgetry, with styling, with buttons, with switches, with this pretty cool and incredible heads-up display. Uh, you know, it was all, um, it was all very neat shit, but what it did was sort of shield the fact that the car, the car was essentially kind of boring, uh, underneath. I mean, you know, it, it I tell you what, I'm going to turn right here and uh, we'll get to the edge of the street. The sun's not out, but it's still going to show Dalton's crappy windshield, so I'll wait till we turn right up there. Hold on one moment. Alright, so there we are. So, uh, the GM10 platform, you know, they spent billions and billions of dollars developing it. Uh, and it really did not live up to expectations. It was a personal luxury coupe at a time when sedans and minivans and SUVs were winning the day. Uh, it came out just at the dawn of the SUV, really, the mainstream SUV. Um, 
the, the Grand Prix, you could call it kind of a touring car. Uh, over many generations, the Grand Prix went from being a full-size car to a mid-size car to a luxury car to a sporty car uh, and a mid-size coupe back to being full-size. It just went through a lot of different incarnations over seven years. But, uh, you know, this was probably the least dynamic of all of them, this uh, 88 through 96. Uh, so Pontiac folded up with gadgetry and buttons and other things to sort of conceal the fact uh, that it was really the birth of the anemic transportation car where, you know, it's unibody, it's tight, it's solid, it's pretty well made, not the worst, uh, reliable, uh, many different parts across many different platforms, really easy to maintain, easy to work on, and uh, just good transportation. I mean, you could put hundreds of thousands of miles on these things, the Buicks and the Oldsmobiles and the Pontiacs. Uh, they just weren't that exciting to do it with. And uh, I think that's why ultimately they're not remembered as fondly as some of the other models. Uh, and of course, they replaced a rear drive model, uh, which, uh, you know, a lot of people loved. And man, that was a tough thing to follow. So uh, it had a lot against it, frankly, at the time. Uh, now, today, you know, there really aren't that many on the road. Uh, people look at them because, of course, a lot of people remember them. A lot of people drove them. They had people who drove them. They knew people who drove them. They drove in them. They went to rock concerts in them. Uh, get on your Pontiac and ride. Uh, Pontiac is no more. The Grand Prix is no more. Uh, so they, they, you know, I won't say they've come into their own on the collector market, uh, but they have made for a bit of a fun entry-level collectible, particularly, you know, ones like this are going to be the cream of the crop. They're going to pull the most dough, 11,000 miles, good options. Uh, you get into the more anemic versions, and you can buy them cheap, 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 even when they're in real nice shape. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, you should. And even the finest examples, you know, there was an 89 Turbo McLaren version. Don't remember if I mentioned it or not. I think I did. Uh, you can buy the nicest one out there for less than 20 grand, really. And, uh, you know, that's a car that was only like... I don't know, yeah, maybe a thousand of or so, thirty five hundred at the most. I don't remember, but something like that. Really low production, and uh, it, it's an awful lot of of interesting collector car for the money. And I don't see that really changing in the immediate future. I think it's another few years before these things get uh, get more expensive. But um, you know, they're holding their own for the moment, and they're creeping upward uh, into that sub twenty grand collector market. Uh, so. So, you know, look, if you got room, it's it's an awful lot of uh, car for the money, uh, what you can get right now. Um, and when you drive it around, you do get attention, you get some thumbs up, you get some people who think it's pretty cool. And uh, I tend to agree with them. I'm having a blast driving this car around. I can't believe the way people look at it and wonder what it is. It was very futuristic for its day. Uh, the headlights up front, the, you know, 0.29 drag coefficient. It was a very, very slippery car uh, when it came out. And and, uh, you know, that, of course, helped with fuel mileage and highway noise and that kind of thing, and buried in traffic. So it's just, uh, I don't know, to me it's a lark, it's a fun car to own. It doesn't really matter today that it doesn't perform the way that people would have wanted it to. It doesn't really matter uh, that it's, uh, you know, rear drive, front drive, whatever the hell, front drive. It just doesn't matter. It's just a fun cruiser, something to take to car shows and, uh, you know, looking pretty neat. So uh, this one is for sale at Auto House of Naples, 239-263-8500, on the web at autohousenaples.com. Uh, we're continuing with our weird Pontiac theme. Uh, I think later this week, maybe tomorrow, I'm going to have another Pontiac Bonneville. Uh, I think we're about to just run out the whole Pontiac lineup at some point. So hopefully I can move on to Oldsmobile soon. Uh, anyway, thank you for having a look. Really appreciate it. And we will see you with the next one. Take care.